Welcome back to The Debrief. We're here for another episode recapping the best and worst of competition climbing, this time talking about the uh, the stacked World Cup in Innsbruck, Austria, uh, both a boulder event and a lead event, which is pretty rare. I think the last one was like six years ago or something in Haiyang, so it was a treat for everybody. And of course, heading into the Olympics, uh, we got a chance to see some of those multidisciplinary climbers have to actually do some work back to back. Uh, as always, I'm Tyler Norton uh, from Plastic Weekly. Joining me as always is John Bergman, the author of High Drama, The Rise, Fall and Rebirth of American Competition Climbing. And our special guest this week uh, joining us from, I think the Boston area of the United States is level four and nearly level five USA root setter, Cody Grodsky, uh, to, to help us break down all the root setting intrigue from this week. Cody, how, uh, how are you holding up? The weather looks amazing behind you. I'm, I'm very <laughs> jealous. Uh, how are you doing, man? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me, man. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, the weather's beautiful today and uh, starting to warm up around here. And um, yeah, it's, it's been really great. Good stuff. What's the weather like out uh, where you are, John? Uh, you know, it, last week was really nice. It was kind of overcast and cool, but then it just feels like starting yesterday and today, we're into the sweltering, humid summer that's yeah. just like, you know, just oppressive heat so yeah that's, here that, it is <laughs> that started for us today like i've just been in like constant rain for the last week it's been like crap and stuff but then like i'm thinking about the people out in vancouver and victoria who are having to deal with like plus 30 temps for the first time at plus 30 obviously celsius sorry um but uh anyway yeah so you know uh sending my thoughts to everybody that's just dealing with like typical toronto weather for the first time out uh out on the west coast screw the weather let's talk about climbing um yeah cody before before we get into it i wanted to just ask you a bit about your experience at the first uh north american cup series event that happened in salt lake city uh just a couple weeks back after the world cup um the u.s has been running these national cup events for a couple years and now you know, in name, at least Canada is involved or not just in name, like we're co-organizers. We're supposed to host a couple events, although our first one is canceled. Um, I just wanted to get some reflections uh, from you on on how the event went and maybe your thoughts on just, you know, fostering continental climbing in North America, in North America, which has kind of been absent for a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd say that the, uh, you know, the North American Cup series, it went off, uh, all things considered, it went off really well um there were so many things to uh be positive about and um you know kind of happy about honestly uh, all things considered you know with kind of the state of the, the state of the world right now right um and i think that on the whole um the event organizers were pretty happy i'd like to think that the athletes were you know excited about kind of coming back to the sport um and i know us as root setters we were just really excited to be to be back doing what we love to do yeah um, unfortunately, just because of like travel restrictions, um, there was only really like what one Canadian and, and she's living in <laughs> Salt Lake city. Right, so, yeah, Allison, you know, yeah, yeah you could kind of couch that. Um, but I'm curious if, if it's something that comes up in the States at all is like, is there really an interest of doing more continental climbing? Like, I know we all say like all this stuff is great and, you know, the more climbers, the better, but you know, from, in, from a Canadian perspective, it would be extremely valuable to us because, our scene is not quite as developed as yours. And of course our competitor pool is much smaller. Um, but from like a root setter perspective, from a climbing perspective, do you guys feel like it's a good thing that some of those, those stops on your national tour are now being sent up North? Is there like a kind of discussion about that at all? Um, I mean, internally, I'm sure there's, you know, there's lots of discussions <laughs> about, you know, what is, <laughs> what is best for the sport, uh, at least from the, the U S perspective, I'd say for myself personally, um, it, it's fantastic. It's it's uh, it's kind of what we need. I feel like to elevate our our level uh, as athletes and also as root setters um, to prepare our athletes for the world stage uh, because there just is such a difference. No matter where you no matter where you go and where you set um, and no matter where you climb, depending on uh, you know the officials that are there or the walls that are in place or the, the hold selection. You know all these things kind of impact it, it from you know big to small on how athletes might perform so at the base level just getting these athletes uh increased experience internationally is something that i know will uh help us greatly moving forward cool uh, and before we start talking about the world cup last thing i wanted to ask was a bit about uh the u.s head coach josh larson um we'll talk about the athletes as we 
cover the event, but you kind of grew up in the same sphere and 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 worked with uh, Josh, or at least in the same area as him for a bit. Do you have any just reflections on this guy? Because the, the, the joke I always think about in my head was my first impressions of Josh. The first one is him making that dumb face in the uh, the insiders video. There's like, just like he's, he's in it for a second, but he's just like making some dumbass face. And then the next time, which, you know, I doubt he remembers um, was uh, I was at Metro rock for a root setting clinic, a US, like a level one clinic eight years ago or whatever. And he was the guy that got the, like the shit job of having to unlock the gym at like 6 30 AM to let in all of these like <laughs> crap root setters. Uh, and he was just like, you know, just obviously not happy to be there. But, um, so those are my like only two interactions with him. So could, do you want to flesh out this guy a little bit and maybe yeah. what he brings yeah, to the team? Cause I think you, maybe you got a bad person. <laughs> yeah, still in from but, there, from yeah. there but to, to being the head coach of the United States national. Yeah. yeah. All right. I mean, I'll start off by saying that, uh, I, Oh, most of where I'm at right now to Josh and uh, and to Dave, who were both, uh, you know, just these cornerstones at Metro Rock. Um, you know, I had a little bit of experience coming. Um, I was working at a climbing gym in my area over here called Carabiners. Uh, it was it's a pretty large facility. It's not like a particularly uh, uh, high end facility. Was that the um, New I, Haven gym? Am I remembering that right? Or Providence? Uh, that's a, or okay yeah. all right yeah they, they have one in fairfield now i guess but the one i grew up at or not grew up but started working at was uh in new bedford um kind of just like just outside of cape cod i know i know we're really off topic but did it have like a a pillar that had another pillar yeah. above it and there was a break in yeah. the middle yeah okay yeah ridiculous cool. but cool it's pretty cool and you can like climb on the roof or like on the ceiling and right. stuff so there's like climbable square footage it's insane um it like all held right. records for years and years but um yeah, you know, I had some experience there and then, um, you know, kind of moved up north for school and figured, oh, you know, I'll apply to Metro Rock. And I really didn't know a heck of a lot about root setting and, and climbing, but I just knew that I really loved it. And uh, yeah, long story short, uh, short um, Josh kind of took me under his wing for whatever reason. I still don't know. Um, and kind of introduced me to into the world of uh, competitive climbing and competitive root setting kind of right out the gate. Um, it just kind of threw me threw me right into the fire um i think one of my first competitions i got to set was actually a uh, dark horse maybe season two or three or something like that um and just being thrown into that kind of atmosphere and that environment i mean after the first event concluded or like as it was underway i was so kind of enraptured by like how this this whole scene was and the, the energy and the passion and the excitement of of not just the climbers, but the fans um, who were, you know, showing up from all over to watch this. It really got me excited. And um, Josh really introduced me to that. And um, kind of from there, you know, our friendship and relationship grew and we were setting, climbing. Um, we did, uh, we used to guide the team together. We would coach uh, like the national team and various university teams together with him for being by far and away, like the most experienced, you know, is the head coach of all those uh, team. So again, he was like teaching me a lot about, about that. And, um, then we went on a big, uh, a big road trip, probably, I don't know, eight years ago. Now we went uh, across North America. We did like a little video series, um, with Epic TV called lost in North America. Um, and which we traveled around to 10 different locations across, uh, across yeah, North America. We spent a little bit of time in Squamish. Um, that was pretty much our only Canadian, you know, uh, escapade there. But yeah, I shot a little series. And, um, you know, after that trip, we both kind of went separate ways. Um, you know, I moved down south, got a job in Chattanooga. Um, he then not too long after went out west. Um, so here we are, you know, and just working with him last week uh, at the North American Cup. It was the first time we'd worked at an event together since probably one of the last few dark horses, um, maybe season six or so. Um, so it was really cool. It was really cool to like kind of come full circle after not being together and hanging out too much. And now we got to set this big event and uh, it was a lot of fun. He's yeah. a great guy. What uh, what would you place as kind of like the the big things that he brings to that position as the as the national team coach? Like what are his strengths as a coach? Uh, he's extremely perceptive. Um, he can he can look at athletes and the way they're climbing and instantly break it down in his mind and frame it in a way that is palatable to that athlete, right? So um, everyone learns differently. Um, I have a, a background in education and uh, experiential education and um, 
you know, different, different types of, I won't, I won't uh, bore you all about all of that, but a lot of the research I've done, it's, it's really interesting. Like everyone learns differently, right? Tyler, so you, you learn a certain way that's different from me. It's different from John and Josh is able to kind of curate that experience for each athlete, um, which I think is super, super helpful when you're dealing with, um, such elite level athletes, everyone has their own needs and their own focuses, um, that they have to kind of work on to progress. I'd say that's one of his biggest strengths. Um, but then maybe a close second, or maybe it's right up there tied for first is his, his ability, his like personal climbing ability. Um, he's always been one of the stronger guys that I've worked with and working with him in Salt Lake was I mean, he did boulders faster than the athletes did in, in the comp. Now, granted, it's a root setting, you know, environment and then it's a comp environment. They're two so totally different things. But to just watch him smash boulders, like smash them and then watch, you know, some of our top athletes have a difficult time on them shows like the caliber that he's at and where he's able to perform. So he's able to kind of have that, not just that secondhand experience or, or, you know, kind of looking from a different lens from, you know, 10,000 feet above and being this coach, he's actually there on the ground interacting with the, the climbs as are the athletes and having these one-on-one conversations, which I think is invaluable. That's really cool. That's yeah, that jives with kind of what we've heard from other people. So that's interesting. Hopefully we'll get the chance to talk to him at, uh, at some point, but I'm assuming going into the Olympics, these guys are pretty busy and now they're on a European road trip. So probably radio silence for a little bit, but anyways, I'm glad we got somebody with, uh, with that kind of perspective on. So let's talk about Innsbruck. Um, the way we do this show, if you haven't watched before is we talk about the big headlines, like what's the, what's the banner headline on the, on the New York times about this, uh, about this competition. And then we also talk about our biggest winners from the event and the biggest losers. So we're going to start with headlines. I'm going first today. And I was making a pun about this and maybe I shouldn't, but I'm going to anyways. And if it turns out shit, then whatever. But my headline is athletes tell the Austria, uh, the Austrian public broadcaster to butt out. Um, for me, the, the thing that kind of ended up taking over the narrative of this whole competition, unfortunately, was multiple instances of uh, the cameraman and in an instance, also the director not using just having bad judgment on how they perform their job. Um, the first kind of notice of this was during uh, the lead semifinals and finals where the guy with the, the gimbal or the steady cam or whatever it was, was getting really close to athletes. And in some moments, it was giving you these excellent shots where you're getting very close to their face. You see that emotion. And, uh, and honestly, in a few instances, it was really useful. But the second you could tell in the athletes' faces that like this guy's getting too close, it made it super awkward um, and started ruining things. And then, of course, it culminated in, first of all, uh, Yanya accidentally smacking the camera as she was miming Beta. The guy was like that close uh, to her. Adam Andra also having to call the guy out as he's like about to step onto the wall is being like, hey, man, you're too close right now. After which the cameraman like like kneeled under Andra as he starts his climb, like completely in the fall zone, which <laughs> was like a little bit sketch. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the final instance um, being uh, it, an unwise shot of the rear end of uh, Joanna Farber in semifinals, which forced them to take down semis and edit it out and, of course, issue an apology. Um, the only thing I really want to bring up about this, because like I'm, I'm not one to talk about, you know, a female perspective on the sexualization of sports, but I did want to just talk about how upsetting it is that... You know, from from my perspective, when a big broadcaster like the the Austrian broadcaster, the Japanese broadcaster, when they're the ones in charge of of doing these broadcasts, usually the quality is just incredible, and it's it's a it's a it's a net positive for the event. And in a lot of ways, it was a, a really positive influence as usual at this event where there were clearly way more cameramen. There was a certain amount of polish that you don't normally see in the IFSC events, which was excellent. But somehow these like these kind of dumb mistakes of just like getting way too close to the athletes and then a really poor editorial decision um, ended up just being the main talking points from the entire uh, thing. And I was just wondering if you guys felt the same way, like that that it just kind of pooped all over the the event and it's now like the one big talking point that I'm sure the write-ups are going to kind of focus on when they're published. 
I can, I can, ch I, can uh, I can hop in here yeah, go for it. first. Um, yeah, I think to your point, Tyler, the thing that one of the things that really surprised me was that they they kept happening these instances, right? Like it, it first, I can't remember if Brooke was first or if Adam was first in the semis, but but one of them, um, like Brooke, they it, there was this great instance of it. Uh, the framing of Brooke, the camera framing of her. The, it just so happened that the DJ was playing this like really epic music, um, and the and the crowd in the background. It was a great shot. It was very cinematic, and I'm all for that. But at one point, as the camera's kind of circling around Brooke, she kind of like just like like laughed to herself because it was like, I, and I don't know if she laughed because it was it was just weird that he to her that he was like framing her like this or if maybe it was because he was too close i i don't know but but then um with adam like you said he's going to the wall and he actually mumbles something i tr i played it back tried to de detect what he said and i think he said hey man too close or something like that um you think after that it should it should stop that should be the end of these this intrusion right like i mean it shouldn't have happened in the first place but especially if you're a cameraman, if you're a member of the media, once the athlete, an athlete says to you, hey, back off, like, that's it. There's, anything beyond that is, it is inexcusable. Um, and then it just gets worse and worse, as you pointed out, first with Yanya and then the, Yo the Johanna thing, which is kind of like, uh, it's outrageous for its own, you know, for that, for being intrusive and then just for its own other myriad reasons. Um, so I, I think the only thing I would add to what you said is just like it was just it was ridiculous that it kept happening. Like how who how does this how do you not sort of nip this in the bud after one instance, after the very first instance of an athlete smirking at this or, or laughing or chuckling or or reacting that it's too close or whatever. It should have stopped with Brooke or Adam and, and it didn't. And that's kind of inexcusable. Yeah, I think um, I think you guys bring up some good points and I, I don't know if I really want to touch the Johanna thing I mean that was I think everyone agrees anyone who's read about it watched it whatever agrees that, that was a huge huge issue uh, and nothing like that should be tolerated right uh, aside from that though I think that it's a really interesting uh, interesting concept um, just like specifically talking about the field of play for for climbing versus the field of play for other sports right so we we can all agree that i think the quality of this event from like the camera working perspective the production value was really high higher than we've seen in years past which is fantastic and the thing is is i don't know how many of these cameraman cameramen or even these production managers uh understand what climbing is right so the field of play in football or basketball, you have your out of bounds, right? No cameraman, coach, whatever is allowed in that field of play. If you're the five on five, right? Those are your those are your athletes who are in the field of play plus your ref. That's it. Cameraman gets the shots from where they can outside the field of play. Climbing, we define the field of play, but there's nothing that's innately out of bounds from the perspective of a cameraman. Uh, on the contrary, they're being told get these tight shots. What's, you know, what can we talk about? Look how small that hold is. Look how bad that, you know, that hold is, you know, like whatever, like bringing these perspectives that maybe viewers from home who aren't as educated to the sport can look closely and see, oh, this is what they're talking about. Right. So I'd say that in that, in that sense, they just lack the perspective as maybe the, that, that production company. And I think there's going to be growing pains, right? Because clearly this is going to be talked about a heck of a lot more than just us this week. Um, and that feedback is going to get filtered through the IFSC and through that, that TV production company. And they'll probably say, yeah, you guys did a great job. But hey, you need to back the hell off the athletes, right? Um, you were just far too close and you were impacting their ability to perform. So I think if those things get kind of just dialed in just a little bit, I think you can still maintain that super high production value while also not you know kind of creating issue um for the athletes and their performance i don't think we'll ever get much insight on like the on the particular personnel or whatever but the you know the what what strikes me is that i i don't believe the ifsc has a staff member like i don't think the head of media or whatever is spending the event watching the stream right like if if the ifsc has their contracted broadcasters running the stream they trust those guys to right. put out a stream that's high quality and in this event they trusted the orf which like if if you're unclear it's like it's the american pbs it's canadian cbc like it is the central national broadcaster so imagine pbs 
putting out that shot, like that being like, that's kind of the, the, the context is framed in the IFSC trusted them to, to put on a good show. Now, I, I definitely agree with you that the IFSC probably is responsible for not communicating guidelines on how to behave in the field of play. Um, there are frequently people in the field of play, the official photographers and, and often the official videographers. But, you know, the guys that travel the circuit obviously have a better uh, uh, sense of judgment uh, for that stuff. So maybe there is kind of like a, a policy that needs to be written or updated or just expressed better. But I'm mostly just struck by by, yeah, how how this might affect the, the relationship uh, with the ORF and maybe particularly with that producer, with that director or whoever was calling the shots, because man, if like if I ever have CBC come to to, uh, to like a, a climbing comp up here, while I'm probably going to have to brief their crew on like, hey, these are things that are important in this sport that you have to uh, get used to. These are the kind of shots we like. This is how you have to be careful of safety. I'm going to entrust a national broadcaster not to put that kind of shot over the airwaves. And I think just to end up my little point is to just make sure we're we're putting the 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 blame in the right spot, right? Like this isn't an IFSC or particularly on the Johanna Farber part. That's not necessarily an IFSC failing. Those decisions in that broadcast was produced by the Austrian broadcaster. So anybody putting that on the IFSC or even like on Matt Groom for some reason, that's not the person to put it on. And I did see some people say like Matt Groom should have called it out or something like that. This guy has been doing the circuit for like half a year. He's not probably in communication with the director. What do you think he's going to say on this like broadcast that's going out nationally in prime time in Austria, as well as around the world? Nobody should be faulting Matt Groom for not, you know, coming up with an incredible defense on the fly while he's trying to do everything else uh, in that situation. So the, the blame should be assigned in the right direction. And it is particularly to the Austrian broadcaster, not to the IFSC. L- yeah. Let me ask and you. I- th- th- oh, sorry, Cody. You, I just wanted well, to jump on something you said. You brought up the really interesting point about the field of play. And mm-hmm. in other in any other sport, like you said, let's take, you know, I don't know, American football as an example, right? You, you would never have a cameraman allowed to like run on the field and and just give him this directive of like, hey, look out for the athletes, like get great shots, but just make sure you sort of stay out of the athlete's way. You would never do that, right? Um, even though, of course, I'm sure he would get some, he or she would get some great shots. Like it's it's nonetheless, you would never you would never allow that. I think we probably would all agree that the mats where they are doing the beta dance or or whatever. Um, that's part of the field of play with us. Like the field of play extends beyond just the wall itself. So similarly, just like you would say in football, well, we would never allow a cameraman on to the field to get great shots, even though he or she might get some great shots. doesn't matter. We won't allow it. Should we say like, you know, no, camera people shouldn't be allowed on the climbing mats. I mean, be, for the same reason. Yeah, they'll get great shots, but... Um, but it's not it's not worth you know having them get in the way and i'm not look i have a lot of good dear friends that are camera camera people and and whatnot so i'm not saying this about them individually i'm just saying kind of like broadly in general uh what do you think about that well two things i'll touch on your thing and then i also want to touch on the the matt groom being called out and the you know production uh producer there but the the first thing i think that um sorry uh I just totally lost my train of thought. I was going on the Matt Groom thing in my brain. Um, you go on the Matt Groom thing. That's fine. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Go, go on the Matt sorry. Groom. Sorry. No, I want to answer your question. Can you just, can you just say it one more time? Sorry. I'm like, yeah, I was like saying just, in, you know, here. in other sports, you would say, hey, these camera people are not allowed onto the field of play, right. even though they might get great shots. And right. so okay. could that same so, logic be applied to climbing? I think it's all about uh, education and experience, right? Um, and I'll touch on that with like, you know, some personal anecdotes, right? So just like we all do, I think we all have friends who have, you know, who are uh, photographers or who are videographers. Who um, isn't a photographer in climbing? Yeah, right, Come yeah, on, really? Yeah, right. Um, but so, for example, so um, done like a number of events. Um, I used to work at High Point, High Point Climbing and Fitness. We had a bunch of climbing gyms throughout the southeast. And a uh, big focus of mine was to host high level events, as high as we could. So we like held a, held the first ever National Cup Series. Then we held it the second year and then the fourth year. Um, and of course, like various regionals, divisionals. Regionals and divisionals, less of an issue. It's a youth comp. But the big high value, high production um, National Cups, especially the first, you know, two and, you know, one, two and four, uh, you know, we had like 
John Glassberg there and louder than 11. Um, and then we also had our in-house crew. The, in, the innate difference between we'll take, because it's easy, John Glassberg from anyone at these production crews that are, are being hired by whatever federation is that John is an experienced, knowledgeable rock climber. He might not look at the boulders right away because he's doing 12,000 other things and say, okay, here's the fall zone. Here's what's going to happen. He'll, he'll take one of us aside. He'll say, hey, Cody, hey, you got five minutes. Can you walk me through these boulders real quick just so I know what shots I'm trying to dial in and where I need to stay the hell out of, hell out of the way? I'll be like, absolutely, man. Let's go through. Here's women's one. Here's what's going to happen. Here's men's one. Here's what's going to happen. He might remember in his brain. He might take a couple notes. He'll, he'll maybe pull aside his assistant or two and explain, do not go over here because this thing is happening. This is where the fall will occur. This is where this dino will occur. So I think if you frame it appropriately to people who know what you're talking about, you can, you can have that balance. You could, you can let them in within reason on the field of play on the mats. If they know what the rules are, if they know how a flash format competition works and what, what the, you know, the beta dance, as you called it, like how that's going to work, like how to stay out of people's way because you know where they're going and what they're doing and then also get get your content. Um, and I think, and if you take that and you're like, okay, you might say, well, Glassberg, that's really easy. Cause he's like this super elite athlete and he's been in the industry forever. Um, one of my best friends, he's, uh, he's the director of marketing communications at high point, And he's also a videographer and a photographer, uh, rock climber, just like us, been rock climbing for a long time. Same conversation can be had. He's not, he's not Glassberg. He's not traveling around the world to get these climbing shots at all these comps and all these like wild foreign locations, but he knows enough about climbing to where I say, Hey Ben, this is what's going to happen. He'll be like, cool. I'll make sure that this person stays out of here. And this person gets the shot and everything is swimming and there's no issues. And the athletes don't have issues. So that's probably the biggest part. We don't want the athletes to have issues while they're trying to perform through the shot. Right. Um, yeah. And I, I want to be clear. I'm not advocating that we do that with the photographers, that we say no photographers on the mat. Right, I'm not right. saying that. I'm just saying it's interesting when you apply the same logic that's applied to other sports. If you put it in climbing, what that would mean. That's all. Right. Uh, totally. And then the last thing I just want to touch on, uh, I know you probably want to get moving to the next question. Um, I didn't hear any of this about Matt Groom getting called out as like, you know, the live stream commentator. I try to honestly close all the comment chats when i watch these youtube videos for just a plethora of reasons um but i can i can speak directly to people um kind of about how the production works at least in like in a super basic way um so i was a part of the um combined invitational in 2020 in plano um i was a part of this the sport crew um but that aside we had espn there um and espn shot the event so they have all their photographers and their videographers and their huge boom camera. I don't even know off the terms of all these like things that they they bring. Whatever they have all their equipment, right? And in the back of the venue, there's a 53 foot tractor trailer that's built out. This thing has to be like tens of millions of dollars, if not more, in production equipment. And it's built out um, kind of like from back to front, where you have like these rooms, and each room is like a next is like a, how do I even describe it? It's like the first room is like security. Basically you're not like, they kind of check your credentials. And then it, if you're allowed into the next room, maybe it's like a sound check. And then after that, it's like a couple of video shots. And then in like the farthest room, very down, way down at the end, it's like your command central. They have like massive TVs everywhere. And there's like somebody, I think they even call him the quarterback. Like he's like the production manager, the producer, he's sitting there and there's people all around him who are like pulling shots and like, uh, pulling like all the raw the raw data for him to just yell and be like camera three this camera four this you get tighter here pull up that you know that replay and he's just screaming for like 12 hours at everybody like I don't know how this guy does it and I went in I went into the the booth me and um, Ryan Sewell were like we have to see what what is going on in this ESPN trailer like this is too cool but the part that's notable is that it is completely closed communication right they have their own radios the only radios that uh, only communication that's going between in and out of the facility is between this, these producers and the camera people like Megan, when she's commentating, she's not talking to the producer. The producer is talking to the cameraman and saying, Hey, get this shot of Megan who's commentating right now in this area of the room. They're not, they're not talking to one another. So like, just so everyone is like completely crystal clear calling out Matt groom for this is like just wrong like he, he doesn't have anything to do with how he's not the one pressing buttons picking shots right i've done live stream commentating too you kind of just get what's handed to you. you you might get lucky enough to have like a 30 inch tv 
there and they like whatever shot pops on in the frame you're now kind of talking about that shot like that's what you got and then it, it, you know you see something like you want to pop on your screen and you're like oh shit like what am i supposed to do? you know you're like shocked right like what am i supposed to do with this this isn't yeah. part of climbing this isn't the event um so yeah just uh just wanted to touch on that right there that's all close communication between the production and, and the camera assistants and all that yeah no t- totally yeah i think that's pretty much like where i landed with that just to get that topic out of the way and we can kind of hopefully move on mostly to climbing so uh yeah i think the next one is uh john what's your uh what's your big uh big headline from this event yeah, there's a lot to go through. There was a it's almost forgotten. There was a speed Euro Euro Speed Cup to kick it to kick things off that was really exciting in its own right. I think if I remember correctly, there was a couple uh, national Austrian national records um that were broken in that, which was which was exciting. But I That's the headline. Austrian national <laughs> speed record broken. Well, it's 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 cool anytime. I think it was like it was broken and then it was broken again and then it was broken again. Um so anytime that happens it's kind of It fun. finally broke but, uh, 10 seconds. Good job. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, sorry. Oh, no. Move, move oh. On. Um my headline my big headline would probably be we are this is it's so exciting because we are in the midst of potentially uh or not even potentially i think we're in the midst of kind of the greatest um single season rivalry that we have seen in recent memory frankly with uh with speaking of of Yanya Garnbrett and Natalia Grossman in the bouldering um and i say i say in recent memory recent history because i think that you probably would have to go back to Mina Markovic versus Jane Kim to find um to find a, a rivalry that has had this level of exciting back and forth, or at least what, you know, it's, I mean, it's early in the season, but um, I, I went back and I looked, let me see my sheet here. So I, I looked at the, the Mina's results and, and Jain's results and whatnot, the 2015 lead season. Um, this is what it was it's kind of fun for us. History buffs, Chamonix, Mina wins, um, Brianson, Jain wins, Imst, Mina, um, there was one in Norway, Mina, uh, Purs, Belgium, Jain, Wujang, Jain, and Kron, uh, Mina. That was, that was the 2015 season. I mean, it was literally, it was like back and forth and back and forth, back and forth. And, 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 and most so, of those, the other climber was the second place yes. uh, finisher yes. as well. Right? right. Yeah. Yes. And, and so just kind of compare it to this season, you know, um, to, to recap in case people, you know, it's already kind of a blur. 2021 lead season, Mayringen, um, uh, Yanya wins. Boulder season, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Boulder season, right, thank you. Uh, Mayringen, Yanya wins. Salt Lake City one, Natalia wins. Yanya's not there. Salt Lake City two, Natalia wins. And and now at uh, Innsbruck, um, uh, wait, sorry. Yanya. Yeah, Yanya, Natalia, Natalia, Yanya. That's what it is. So, uh, which is great, you know, like it's been just, it's been so exciting. Um, and, and people that might listen to this and they might say like, oh, well, what about just like a couple years ago with, with um, Yanya and Cheyun So? And my retort for that would be, that was incredibly exciting, but in hindsight, it wasn't actually that much of a back and forth, right? It was like Yanya wins and then it's like Cheyun, 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 <laughs> Cheyun, right? Like it, so, so what's really cool, it's just, um, you know, it's just fun that it, that, that the story so far has been kind of one takes it and then the next, and then the next, the other competitor takes it the next week. And then the, the ne- other competitor takes it the next week. It's just awesome. It's great fun. Um, it, it makes these seasons so much more exciting when there is that element. Like we said, it's rare, right? 2015. So it doesn't come along every season. Uh, and yeah, so when it does, it's really something special. I was going to nitpick because I was like, no, there've been a bunch of like, you know, there've been all, because like a Kyo Anastor is like, is a, is a classic one as well. And that's been approximately that in that so- uh, Sorry, approximately same uh, uh, time span as as the Jane Kim Mina Markovic, Mina Markovic one. But if you you're right, if you look at it uh, in the lens of just like a single season, it is actually fairly rare where it does feel like it's just switching back and forth between two climbers. Um, often you only see that kind of in aggregate over a large period of time because like Akio will do four in a row and then you'll have somebody else pop up and then Anna and then like vice versa. And so when you're zoomed in, you kind of lose... Uh, you kind of lose that that back and forth narrative, um, 
but uh, but in this case, yeah, you're exactly you're exactly right. Where it is really cool, and I was uh, I was looking up um, now that we're in the in the last half of the Boulder season. It's fun to start looking at where the rankings are for the overall, and j- just an interesting contrast for men. There are still 20 men that can win the overall Boulder season uh, for this year. It goes all the way down to Yannick Floey, but for the women, there's only six. Like it's already really, and a couple of those at the bottom are obviously extremely unlikely. It is basically a one-two between Natalia and Yanya. And interestingly, Natalia has attended all of them. Yanya has not. So Yanya is not going to be able to drop her worst score, whatever that happens to be. Whereas Natalia, I think her worst so far is just third place, which she can drop. And they are in a dead heat in that situation for uh, for the gold, which is fascinating. And I'm and sucks so much that we don't get another Boulder World Cup until October. Like, what is uh, that yeah. about, man? Like, it's That's, not even the same yeah. season. Yeah, that's the that's the downside is that just right when we're, I'm hyping this up, it's it's awesome, it's thrilling, yeah. and it's like, okay, but you gotta wait three. It's like wait, you have to wait like three three months for the next episode yeah. or whatever, you know. So that's too bad. That's a good point. Yeah, um, brutal. And and you know, I maybe Cody would want to chime in here, but the the, the thing that kind of underscores all this is just like. Oh, it would have been so awesome to see Natalia and Yanya battle it out on that fourth boulder in the women's, uh, the women's final because that was an, oh, it was such an, it was a cool boulder. The fact that Stasha and and Akio, you know, made progress on it but couldn't couldn't send it, um, it was just really painting the, the uh, uh, for a great kind of climax in that event to have to see whether Yanya or um, or Natalia would have would have sent it. Um, and it's just going to be, I wrote this in my article. It's going to kind of be forever. One of these, what ifs, because we don't, you don't know who, which one of them or both of them would have, would have sent it. Yeah. I think that's, that's kind of like a bummer for the event. Right. I mean, for everyone, you know, you got to see a little tidbit of this climb and you're like, Oh man, I mean, just aesthetically, it looked really cool. Um, what they did with the volumes and, uh, of course, then the performance on it, you know, you're kind of building and then you get it just taken away and it's kind of like, ah, you kind of wish, kind of wish you got that uh that chance there um i will say though kind of just maybe dovetailing into to my headline of the comp is just and yanya does it again right i mean i think that's inevitably what you're you're gonna see there and i i think natalia has got like tremendous uh tremendous grit and focus and a chance to succeed i think she certainly could take it uh there's a possibility i think she could take it from yanya i i would say though like historically and watching the way yanya is climbing nowadays there's it's probably going to go to Yanya um, all the way through. And I think, again, based on the way we saw Yanya climb, she would have probably flashed that boulder without without too much difficulty. Um, you know, kind of uh, then comparatively, like watching Stasha climb on it and see how she did and, you know, knowing how Yanya climbs as well. I think it's pretty safe to say. I, I was trying to th- I think my gut tells me they both probably would have climbed it. Maybe that's just because they're both kind of seeming so heroic these days, like so yeah. incredible. Um, the only thing that was interesting is I think Matt Groom said on commentary, especially when Akio was was kind of struggling at the upper section, he said he thought that that would that upper section would favor a shorter climber. Um, and so that made me think, oh, well, in that case, like maybe Natalia would have whatever little edge there because I think she is a little shorter than than she Yanya. Is. Um, that was, that's kind of like the only sort of beta insight we have of how, of, of just, and it's just a guess at that of how, you know, either one of them might do the fact that there was that possibly shorter advantage for that kind of chimney wedge position up there, but I don't know. Could you pull that, that graphic up again? Tyler? Yeah, was, totally. Let me, uh, cool. I was just, I realized I, I forgot how to, um, uh, move between the slides so let me see if i can actually remember uh what i'm doing right now but uh so this the the problem you're talking about is this one here the orange one on the screen um women's number four which got climbed by two climbers before the event got rained out uh, and so they canceled this boulder again orange in the center of the screen boulder got canceled after stasia and akio uh put their attempts on it and it ends up not counting in the score um my when i first saw this my, my first thought was like you know not that i'm a root setting you know like a, a oracle or anything but it felt a little bit american and i kind of wondered in my head it was like is this a garrett gregor boulder or something i don't know that was kind of <laughs> my first like impression but maybe maybe you have a, a different opinion I mean, no, I mean, at, at this level of competition, I mean, anyone will tell you it's, yeah, sure. It may be like, I don't, I don't know. I haven't talked to Garrett uh, since, since he's been gone, but like 
maybe he put the holds up, maybe he picked a few of them and like got the skeleton on the wall. And then, you know, inevitably it ends up being the entire crew is involved in just about every decision making process in some capacity throughout the boulder. That's not to say every single person is like turning a drill and like rotating or moving or adding holds, but everyone has the, uh, has the kind of perspective to get the boulder from where it is to where it needs to be. And where it needs to be is a, you know, Boulder Four Women's Finals for Innsbruck, right? And it's right. not just one person who's who's responsible for doing that. It's the entire crew. So, but I will say, what I think is cool though is that you think that oh, maybe this is like an American style, and I think it's it's kind of cool that maybe now we're blending styles a little bit, right? Maybe you're seeing more of an American flavor in Europe, and you're certainly seeing more European flavor in America now. Um, a lot of big part of that I think is to do with uh, the wall angles of kind of what we're seeing. We're seeing like higher quality wall builds and then also see, seeing like every single year, just like cooler and better holds that the root setters have at their disposal. And it's not just like holds that exist in the ether. It's like they're being sent to the comps for us to use. And that's the biggest part. That's what allows um, these kind of uh, aesthetics to happen, which is notable because that's the first thing that we see, right? We're like looking at the climb. And then it also it encourages all the movement that we inevitably are talking about here on the show, right? So very cool. Yeah, I, I wanted to just, just, just because it's an opportunity to talk about it very briefly is the idea of like boulders not being assigned to people. Like I'm, I'm totally cool with um, not assigning, like let's say the blame of a problem not working out. I'm totally cool with not assigning it to a particular person because you're totally right. The judgments of like, will this boulder work? Do we think it's hard enough? Like how should we tweak things? That's a team effort usually. Um, but I, I feel the opposite way when it comes to giving the credit on the overall vision, the aesthetic, the layout, like the the skeleton of the boulder, I, I think is something that you can judge stylistically to one person or another, because it is usually one person that puts up each boulder and it's got their DNA in it. It's got their inspiration for, for the shape and the overall, you know, uh, um, you know, the framework, the skeleton of the boulder. I think, I think that's a place where we can still talk about um, assigning it to a, a single person because I, I personally think that's relevant. And especially so long as we're giving credit, I feel like root setters are suddenly like kind of okay with getting their name on it as opposed to, uh, you know, being blamed for everybody falling or whatever. But I, yeah. that's kind of a distinction I feel like there's room to make. Maybe. I think, I mean, I think it's nice that um... – people are talking about root setting a lot more and they're talking about it in increasingly educated ways. Like that to me is the best part of this whole thing, right? Is that it's not just, Oh, it's, it's too tall. Oh, that puts in the wrong spot. You know, dude, like that's just, Oh man. And so everyone I think is over that. And it's, so it's cool that people are like, Oh, not only do I, you know, like the way this looks and I can have a discussion on how it performs. I also might now a little bit, I might know a little bit of insight into who said it and why they said it and what the discussions were. So that way, like the general public can have these discussions. Um, I will still, I still probably will like, I'll probably fight back a little and say like, even the credit of it is like, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's just, I, I think it just really depends on the event. And I mean, every event is a little different and every crew is a little different and every chief is, I would say, even very different. And the way that you approach a competition as a root setter, uh, maybe from the start of the week and throughout the week, that'll dictate maybe how much influence any one person has on any particular climb. Um, but especially with boulders, I, I might agree with you a little bit more not all the way, but a little bit more on, on lead, uh, on lead events. Um, it's a little bit more personal to the setter or typically setters, like the two folks maybe who are, who are involved in that process. Um, just because there's more there, there's more happening, um, that it's, you know, like, especially if you're working out of a lift, like you get like two people, maybe three, if you got one on the wall and two in the lift or something like that. And it ends up being this much tighter group, um, but boulders, there's just so much conversation throughout and a big part of it just to kind of like slide this conversation, even maybe, I don't know if it's the direction you want to go or not, but like, uh, setting crews these days, it's not just about having uh, someone who's got like just raw power, right? It's like this diversity of skill sets. And so sometimes a boulder will go up on the wall because let's say Tyler, you're the chief and you say, Cody, we really need to see whatever, a coordination dyno or something like that. Um, and I'll say, okay, I'll put the coordination dyno on the wall. Well, maybe I'm not that good at climbing coordination dynos at that level, but you know, John is like a savant when it comes to this shit. 
And so then, you know, you had the idea that we need this this style of boulder. I'm the one who put it on the wall, and then I'm going to holler at John and say, hey, John, come here, man, before we start really forwarding. Hey, boot up real quick. Can you try this move a couple times? I just want to see how your, your body's moving on the wall. And then you might be like, oh, yeah, I've done this uh, in this kind of way before. Maybe we do this, maybe we do that. And we have a conversation. And then, you know what I mean? And before, you know, before, like, the skeleton is almost even on the wall, I've already had, like, two other people conversing about this. And that's before we've started forerunning. Right. And then right. that's before we've ticked, tape tightened it, pulled it down, put it back up after watching semis. And then the whole crew comes together again after watching what we watch in semis and put this final smolder on the wall. So that's a long winded answer of like why I'm like, ah, I just don't think the credit should just give the one person. But I but I do appreciate what you're saying. And I do see I do see where you're coming from and I can see how uh, how you could get there for sure. Can I take us on a little side road here? Um, <laughs> Let's it, go a, a side road of a side road. Um because you you mentioned the lead route, Cody. Now now if if either one of you have are are planning to talk about the women's lead route later in the finals lead route, I won't mention this here. But are are any of you going to bring that up for anything else? Because maybe this is a good. Yeah, I, mean, I have notes on it, but we can oh. we can talk about it yeah. whenever. I bet it's not anything like one. Well, okay, hold on. Let's let's let's. What we can do if if you want is one of my big winners because we're basically about to start the big winners. If we want to just change up the order, I could just say that my big winner was going to be the root setting. I wasn't going to go first, but I'll jump uh, in, and now we have a reason to talk about it. Okay, well, I'll, I'll hold my thought till we get into that. Okay, because cool. I do want to, I, I do want to say, um, we'll, we'll talk about the lead route later, but but I wanted to say something because Cody had mentioned route setting for for the lead for lead, but um, but going back back on the original road, uh, off of these side roads to your to your point, Cody, um, I think it was your headline was Yanya, just Yanya does it again. Um, oh yeah, only, that was the point. Right? Yeah, I forgot. Not only did she do it again, but she gets she wins lead and she wins bouldering, right? And now I know that we can say that bouldering wasn't. I think we can all agree it wasn't the ideal way to end a round. She would have uh, like final, stri- like let's be honest. She had like a six attempt gap over Natalia that I don't yeah. think was going to close in the fourth problem. I think it was I like agree. decisive win this time. I yeah, agree. well, that's I was Tyler. That's one thing I was going to ask you too. Cody and I kind of shared our thoughts. Do you think I don't think you... the th- I don't think the fourth problem would have made a difference? Like maybe in the third place podium because there was room there, but I well, no, you... I think Yanya won the event. Like when Natalia was burning those attempts. Do you think Natalia and or um, Yanya would have topped that fourth boulder just for fun? Any I idea? Think, I think Yanya would have for sure, and Natalia. I don't put anything past her at this point because she'll be climbing, and it looks like she's having a really hard time and then it's just like oh she's at the next hold all of a sudden so i i i would imagine she could definitely top it as well yeah it, and it's, it's so i agree cody great headline it's just a, it's it's like it's not only did yanya do it again it's that she did it in lead and bouldering on the same weekend um just incredible just yeah and know. i think the the throwback is back to i think it was 2003 sandrine levey um doing the same thing i can't remember where it was again i don't know if it was like Katerinburg or something like that in Russia. But anyway, it's been a long time. The one thing I like kind of couch that record with is that it's so rare to have dual discipline events, let alone dual discipline Boulder and lead. Like again, the last time Boulder and lead are in the same event, I'm pretty sure was 2015 for that high ang like triple where they had lead speed and bouldering all at once. Um, so it doesn't come up a lot, but it's very cool that when it did come up, we had an athlete that was so dominant that she could earn that like novelty prize again. That was really cool. Well, and it means more than just a normal year because the Olympics coming up, which she is qualified for, which she will be in the Olympics, it's a combined event. So, like, it, it's not just novel. I, I agree it's kind of – it would be novelty any other year, but this year it's it's actually like a, a statement of really prime – fitness going into the Olympics in, in these multiple disciplines. That's, and I think people would have probably picked her to be kind of the Olympic favorite even before this weekend. But, um, but this just kind of proves that she's, she's literally, uh, you know, as the medals show, she's in top form in both bouldering and lead heading into the Olympics. Yeah. Let's move on to big winners. Um, and I think John, I have you going first, if I have that right. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so now that you've claimed a bunch of big winners, who's your actual big winner? What's the, what do you want to, yeah, I'll, I'll say, you know, my big winner was, um, I'm kind of surprised we haven't really mentioned him yet, but Jakob Schubert, because um, he, you know, uh, kind of what we just said with, with Yanya, um, you can't ask for anything better in terms of confidence booster, preparate, whatever, than winning on an, an one of these World Cups heading into the Olympics, especially because we've said so often that these competitors are not 
presumably training to peak at these World Cup events. They're training to peak at the Olympics. And so for Tiakob to win uh, a gold medal um, in the lead discipline, that was great. And, and, and interestingly, I'll relate this to what I was just mentioning about Olympic predictions. I don't like to give predictions. I know you don't like to do it, Tyler, either, but it's just kind of natural. People are, people like to talk about it and ask us what our predictions are for the Olympics. I think a lot of people, most people would agree, and most people cite Tomoa as kind of the the the, fir, the big favorite for the Olympics in the men's division. Um, and Jakob, his name has come up, Jakob's name has come up a lot as kind of the one B slot. It's like, it's like, you'll, you'll say Tomo is probably the favorite fair, yeah. and, then, and then people say, oh, well, who else? And you're like, well, Jakob Schubert, right? Yeah. And yet if you, if you look at this world cup season so far, and again, I, you know, it's, it's not exactly apples to apples when talking about this season and Olympics, but when you look at this season so far, um, his results are just as good, if not better, than Tomoa's so far. Um, he, you know, uh, and because in addition to this victory here this weekend in the lead, Jakob also got third place at one of the Salt Lake City bouldering events. And um, now I know, obviously, like speed is the big is the big X factor, and Tomoa's fantastic at speed. So, like I said, take this, take all this with a grain of salt. But it's just interesting that Jakob has always been cited as kind of the 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 secondary choice for the Olympic favorite. And yet, so far this World Cup season, I think he's making a pretty strong case for maybe he should be the considered everybody's first choice in terms of Olympic favorites. I don't know. Just kind of something fun to think about. But Jakob Schubert, my big winner. Yeah, I um, I, I, I think it's it's like a little bit cut off by the fact that we didn't get to see his big competition petition to actually like, you know, fully compete on the climb. Um, but no, I think you're right from that angle. Just, you know, if you talk about those two, two athletes, Tomoa and Jakob, Jakob is this, this just like uh, this nonstop history of longevity and, and being active in bouldering and lead being successful in both. Of course, in the men's field, it doesn't look anything the same as it does in the women's field. Like being a dominant boulder or elite climber in men's doesn't mean winning five events in a season. It just like doesn't work that way on the men's side. Um, but he, he is always consistent. He's always in the game. And so I think Jakob Schubert is like kind of, uh, safe pick isn't the right word, but if you want to talk about a steady climber, then yeah, I would pick somebody like Jakob Schubert, who's always in the, in the game. I think Jakob is, let's let, let me put it this way. I think Jakob is pretty well guaranteed to make a podium at the Olympics. Whereas Tomoa, I think has the higher variation. And I think he might be more likely to earn first place, but I also think there's a higher chance that he bombs out by false starting in the speed, getting a silver in Boulder when he could have easily got gold. Like he's just like a prolific silver medalist at this point. So I, I take your point. They, they both have like very different kind of uh, uh, history of results that make them favored in different ways. Yeah. Yeah, that's the point. It's like, it's. I wouldn't say like, at this point, I don't know if I'd say one is more favorited than the other. I think you yeah. almost have to put them side by side. Yeah, no, that's one. that's that's very reasonable. Yeah, man. Those, yeah. those sound like predictions to me. I don't know. <laughs> no chance. Sean McCall and Atlanta yet. First place guaranteed. Was, okay, don't, right. don't worry about it. That's the only prediction yeah, I'll make. We're going on predictions. I think uh, women will climb first. Yanya will sweep. And then <laughs> Yanya's going to go compete against the men. And then she's going to sweep yeah, that. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Yanya all the way there. Yeah, man. Yeah, that's my winner. I don't know who was next on the winners, but uh, I think yeah, it was, comes mine. I think it was me. Uh, and yeah, like I mentioned before, uh, my winner is going to be the root setting. Um, and and I mean, part of why we we wanted to bring in uh, Cody this week was because there was all this ephemeral crap that ended up happening that we didn't expect. But the big thing coming into this event was, if you're not aware, that the root setting crew for this event was uh, the Olympic root setting crew. The people that set these boulders and lead climbs are the exact same people, aside from any assistance. Um, they're the exact same people going to the Tokyo Olympics. So it's Adam Pustelnik and uh, Percy Bishton, plus their crew of uh, a handful of other people who I don't entirely remember, but I know uh, Garrett Greger is one of them from the States as well. Um, and so coming into it, there was a bit of a magnifying glass of like, you know, how, how are these guys going to work together? 
this is their last chance to put on a big comp together. And I think also their first chance to put on a big comp together. So we're going to use it as a barometer to see how things are going. And I thought it went incredibly well. The separation was excellent. The climbs looked great. Um, in bouldering, nobody could have expected it, but they got practice at setting a three boulder final without knowing it. And it still worked freaking awesome. Like, it, it, you know, they got exactly what they uh, what they were looking for. Um, so, yeah, I, I was extremely impressed. And, uh, you know, at a comp like this, it could have been like, really, it's just a luck of the drive people. If like the the audience kind of opinion is whether or not the root setting was good, like it's, it's just barely up to the root setters, honestly. But I think this left a really good taste in everybody's mouth. Um, and I think everyone was impressed if if the root setting is of this style, of this aesthetic, of this mixture of movement for both the lead and the bouldering. I think we're in really good shape. The one thing I want to bring up just because it's a, 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 a particular thing that I like is is on the lead climb I really appreciated that the roots were broken down into visually distinct chapters where they used color and uh, hold uh, series to make it so that as you climbed through the audience could see oh they're in this starting green section now they're in this blue section this black section and the style of the climb kind of adapted as you went through the different colors and I think that's the best way to tell stories with lead climbing because if the whole route is just blue or the whole route is a, a jumble of colors it can kind of be hard to tell where you're at but when you have that color change in chapters it makes the viewing experience so good and it, it gives a sense of progression that audiences can like follow a lot easier so that was like an extra bonus for me yeah i think they i i wouldn't i wouldn't be surprised if they continued that because that has been the feedback that um consistently uh folks watching from home have said so we did that um to kind of bring back again we did the combined in 2020 and um ryan sewell chief that from the sport side of things and i wish i had the photo maybe i can send you the photo so you can kind of see it we broke it down sure. uh with like foot jibs basically of like colors that we were going to do and how we were going to uh, set the climb um, using this little like model or the, whatever. Um, so that way people from home could do exactly what you say. They could follow yeah. along. And like, so my parents, you know, or watch the event or like my in-laws or grandparents, they might like flip, flip through and like they get that it's climbing and the person who gets highest wins, but that's more or less where the, you know, it, that's kind of ends. Um, but it was cool. Cause they were able to say like, Oh, I saw, I saw the girl, she got to the orange section mm -hmm. and, or like where orange and green were mixed, you know, we did it. I think we did it in qualities. We didn't do it in finals, but in, in qualities, they were able to say like, oh yeah, she got really high on the orange part. And to me, I was like, oh cool. I like, they were able to have a little bit more conversation and because of it, they felt more invested, right? Cause they yeah. were able to like comment on something where traditionally they're not really able to. They're like, yeah, they got high. I would have been scared, you know, then <laughs> that's kind of where the conversation <laughs> stops, right? And it's not like that's not a slight against them. It's just like that's how we consume sports a lot of times. If you're not familiar with it, you're just kind of going with the lowest common denominator. And right now it's height, scared, and color. And if we can like introduce <laughs> that third aspect to it, then maybe we have like a chance at capturing more audience members, which yeah. I think is huge. Yeah. Yeah, man. It, yeah, it's did... interesting, Tyler. I was, I, I just want to say I was watching it and I, I, Cody, I was actually, I kept an eye on the chat. Um, I know you said you kind of avoided it, but I was, yeah. it seemed like people were kind of, uh, at, at, when we were heading into the bouldering finals, they were saying, okay, let's see a, a crack, a crack problem, you know, and then we didn't get one. So it was interesting to me. I was saying, I wonder if what we didn't get, um, if we can read anything into that and, and see maybe if they're withholding it for the Olympics, you know, just, just speculate, not anything you want to make a huge deal of, but it's like, well, we didn't get any, I'm t thinking like flashy moves, which is presumably they'll want to set some flashy moves, right. For the Olympics, because that's your, you, you have this uh, uh, largely like non endemic climbing audience. So I'm like, okay, what kind of flashy moves did we not see in the bouldering? We didn't see any uh, cracks, you know, not not that flashy, but it is like a, I was going to say, thing. there's nothing less flashy than watching a guy just like, it's true. Hand it's in true. a thing and then just fall. Like, it's, like, iconic, right? it's, it's, it's iconic. just a climber thing. Like that's just for yeah. us. Yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe you're right there. But I was also thinking like, well, we didn't, I don't think we saw any like crazy paddle dino things. Um, we didn't see any bat hangs. We didn't see any uh, like outward facing stuff. I, I was just thinking like all these things we didn't see. I wonder if that's because they want to have the big reveal for those things. 
be at the Olympics. That's it. I don't think there's a big point to make about all this. Okay. <laughs> it might be just nothing, but I just thought it was interesting. Um, it's almost like are the details in what they did not show us in terms of the Olympics. Sure. Yeah. And Tyler, you know, you, you mentioned how you thought the biggest winner was, was root setting. And I thought the coolest part about having this kind of dry run for the setters is, is the chemistry that they get to kind of work together at a super high level event setting for the athletes more or less that they're going to be setting for. And the, a huge part about root setting that I think kind of gets glossed over um, and pr pr pretty naturally. So is that like, it's, we always just talk about the root setting being like the holds that are on the wall and the final product that exists and how we're consuming it or how the athletes are consuming it. And we're talking about it, but root setting is like so much more than that when it comes to like competition week, especially a high level competition week, because there's so many more factors and variables that are going in to the decision-making process. Right. And I, and this almost may sound like stupid, simple, but um, it's very true. Is like your relationship and your, the way that you're interacting with your teammates, right? We have to have this like innate level of trust with one another that we're going to like make these appropriate decisions, um, which I think is maybe the most important part of the whole thing. Um, but then you look at these like other things where these guys are living together, right? For like a week, 10 days, they wake up together, probably sharing a room, right? Or in some cases, like sharing a bed, you know, because there's just not enough rooms. Like the budget wasn't given to them to like get a nice place close enough to the venue. How many times that's happened? Sleeping on a floor or a closet, right? So you're maybe not getting great sleep. Then you're like fighting over a single kitchen, right? You like have how many burners are you going to have to cook your breakfast, right? So maybe then you're taking food to go. How many hours are you spending at the gym? Well, then you're going to go get lunch together. So you're either walking together or you're driving somewhere. And then you get back home after umpteen hours at the gym or the venue, and then you're either going out to eat and hanging out and having a conversation or you're fighting over that damn stove again. And then you go back to bed and maybe like, you know, again, you're in a sleeping bag, you're on a couch, you're sharing a bed with some other guy and you get to know each other like really well. And sometimes that can be, you know, for some people it can be tough and it can, it can lead to issues at the event. It can lead to butting heads when it comes to decision making processes later on in the week because maybe in the beginning oh me and tyler are best friends we're having a great time we just met oh you're from canada i'm from boston when we're gonna have a great time i never set i've never climbed with you before and then i might really just man you, you could be doing these things throughout the day or throughout the week where like might rub me the wrong way or vice versa and then that can like truly impact how we're having conversations about the rock climbs and it's it's funny to even think about but it does happen it's just like natural it's human nature the way that it works so i think you know, the event, it went great. The boulders look cool. The leaders look cool. But these guys getting to work together and understand one another from like a, a human perspective is probably the biggest win moving forward to having the highest quality Olympic event. I wanted to ask you um, about the mentality of being a root setter when the stakes are really high. Um, so talking about the Olympics, the stakes aren't particularly high in terms of, you know, for as climbers, well, okay, I'm just going to speak for myself. I don't really care how the the Olympics turns out. I just want it to look really good and ideally have somebody that speaks English win the event because I think that would be the best thing for for the sport worldwide, um, or at least where I live, I guess. Um, but you've got so many eyeballs on it, and the root setting is going to go whatever way. Or sorry, not the root setting. The climbing is going to go whatever way it goes right? Like they're, I think they're going to top stuff. They're not going to top stuff. They're all going to top it. Nobody's going to top, like who knows what's going to happen. Can you talk a bit about like how different root setters, um, approach that level of like, once the job is done and the climbing starts, how do you deal with that kind of, uh, <laughs> like you're, oh, you're, yeah, you're yeah. basically separated at that point. You have no more control over how things go. So I'm, I'm assuming like some root setters, I imagine the really senior guys are pretty Zen about it and they're just, you know, they just like let go and what happens happens, but there have to be some people that are kind of freaking out in the chair, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think so. And, but I think if you're talking about the highest level events, whether that's like in a country or within like, you know, Europe or North America, or now on the like world stage through the Olympics, you're going to only have those like super, uh, experienced root setters. So yeah, I'd say for the most part, um, and again, I'm blanket statementing here of like folks sure. that I've worked with in the past. Um, it, it, people are pretty Zen people are pretty chill. Like it is what it's going to be. I, I trust you guys you guys trust me. Hopefully we've thought everything through. I mean, the biggest fear is that like 
you know, we didn't screw a volume all the way to the wall or something like that's the only thing, honestly, for me that I like quadruple check before we leave the night before the event. And then in the morning, I'm always like running around and just like looking around, making sure we have enough set screws and everything just in case it, the last thing you want is someone to get hurt because you fucked up, right? You, you, someone ripped off a volume and they got hurt. The event, in my opinion, is then, I mean, if it's not entirely ruined, it's pretty damn close to being yeah. ruined. Um, and so that's the only part for me that I'm like, ah, I just want to, but then again, you just, you look at it and you say, no, I, I went all the way through all these other folks went all the way through. We checked everything. We were confident in our decision-making process. We made educated decisions based on the information that we had in front of us. If it's qualies, it's even more of a roll the dice, right? Qualies is like, you don't know who's going to show up, how they're going to show up. Are they, are they feeling good? Are they feeling strong? Do they have a good night's sleep? There's no way to know. But then semis you have a little bit more info and you even make more educated guesses. And then by the time you get the finals, you have all this data to, to pull from and you, you have multiple climbs to kind of look at and say, this is how this athlete was performing on this weekend. And here's the examples. And you're allowed to allowed to make much more like quantitative decisions where, you know, previously you're making more qualitative decisions. So that's not to say there aren't folks who still like kind of, you know, freak out a little bit. And I'd say that the, it kind of switches a little bit for me personally. Like if I'm chiefing an event, I'm typically a little more stressed, like a little bit more, like there's just more going on. There's like a little more you're like globally responsible for even things that might not traditionally fall under the scope of practice for root setting. Like you're kind of involved in, like you need to like help educate maybe the judges on something. Yeah. You might have be having be pulled into meetings with uh, the live stream, like, Hey, how, how are we going to shoot the live stream? You're going to have conversation. There's just more to think about. So there's more to maybe stress about because you're putting more of the, uh, expectations on maybe people that you're not as familiar with. Yeah. But when it comes to the root setting and especially then when you're like an assistant on the crew, you can kind of look and say, cool, everyone, we did a good job. We feel good. We're going to leave the gym now. We're going to leave the venue. Things, things look good. That's all you can do. Yeah. That's it. You can't do anything more than that. And, uh, so yeah, I'd say most of these guys, they'll be, they'll be stressed a little, I think in the Olympics, just cause they know everyone's watching, but, um, I'd like to think that they're so confident and experienced that they'll be fine there. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So who's your biggest winner from this week? Well, I had a bunch of biggest winners and nobody, nobody picked them off my list here. So nice. I'm actually, uh, so now I get to pick which one I, what I want. Um, if I can pick two and i'll just speak briefly on them. i don't know if that's cheating or not but um you know what no no I'll, I'll... John, john gives the thumbs up so yeah go you give for the it thumbs up? okay all right so, I, I was I'm... muted so i did the thumbs up okay all right so i'm in between um team japan and team usa those are my biggest winners team japan um they had six athletes alone in in boulder finals three medals between them all men's sweep right the women could have just as easily then if the you know the boulder round went different with boulder four happening or it wasn't like just pouring rain for all day like who knows what could have happened yep. point being is all these athletes showed up and they showed up really well so i think team japan as a whole has a lot to look forward to coming through the olympics and then just like their their pool like their athlete pool there's just always like new athletes where i'm like i don't even know if i've heard of that person like yeah. where, where did they come from and then they're like qualifying in fourth going in finals yeah. you know like who's that guy and they're like, like oh yeah he's on the c that? team <laughs> yeah it's yeah. just like and, what and they're outperforming they're like a team guys or, or yeah. b team girls or who, whoever so that i mean i don't even know if there needs to be a whole heck of a lot said there that's just that just is what it is and that's no secret um i think they have a a long time of dominance in the field for uh for the future and that'll be pretty cool to see um but then i also mentioned team usa and i think that it's really cool to see um our athletes not just getting to the world stage and like competing because for a long time that was like the just the bar like oh man it'd be really cool if we can get our athletes to villar if we can get our athletes to <laughs> innsbruck like that was just we just like oh man i hope they get there oh man you qualified 50th well hey at least it was not 80th you know like that was kind of where we were at and now we're not just seeing our athletes show up. We're sh seeing them make semis. We're seeing them make finals. We're seeing them podium and take home golds. And that's something that we haven't seen. And I think a lot of people after Salt Lake, especially after like the first Salt Lake, were like, ah, oh, well, you know, home field advantage. Oh, maybe they got lucky. Maybe blah, 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 whatever. But then you get like the second weekend. And, and then people might still say, well, they're still in America. They're still in the U.S., you know, home soil, whatever. But now they fly the whole team over to Innsbruck. And what do we see? We see super 
uh, a super showing of consistency uh, and basically just showing that Team USA belongs. They belong in both disciplines. They can perform. And I think that's really exciting because I don't think we've even hit our stride yet. You know, like we just got the training center running like Josh and Meg. They've been like crushing it with with their uh, Olympic team, with their national team. But imagine what will happen two years from now when they when they really have hit their stride, when they really have this kind of performance, you know, in motion um, and dial in even again, like little things like travel plans, travel arrangements, like they'll next time know, like if this Innsbruck experience was a success, they're not just going to look at like, oh, what did like Natalia eat this day or what did Brooke do or what did Nathaniel, like how are they feeling? They're going to look at like, oh, was that hotel good for us? Like, did you guys get a good night's sleep there? Cool. Yeah. We're booking that hotel again. Or like just like little things that like might not even matter like to us outwardly thinking about it will matter to them. And dialing in all these little things means that next time they show up, they're even more comfortable. They're more comfortable in a foreign environment that maybe is now not so foreign. And I think that's really important and will show that Team USA is going to just continue to dominate uh, and increase, I'd say, especially in the next three years. I I, can, I, I agree on a, on a season scale. I thought this event was a, a little more polarized in that I thought one of my options for biggest winner was Brooke Rabatou, um because, you know, aside from... I think 2017, she had some like good semifinals results, but in 2018 and 2019, she didn't put up the kind of results that I would say make her like an Olympic favorite. But this season, she is just like blowing my face off. I don't know what's happening. And then for the first lead event, she comes out and she's like, oh yeah, I can do this really well too. Which I think people in the States are all like, oh yeah, she's always been a really good lead climber, which is great. And I'm sure she is, but to earn like a, like, what was it? Second place? Uh, Second yeah. Place. yeah. Like, what hap what ha what happened that like she spent a lifetime in team abc she's got like this un unbelievable like you know uh uh pedigree of climbing and then she's done a bunch of world cups and nothing really showed up what happened this year that she's now like freaking incredible so i thought she was a big winner but on the flip side um she didn't have a great uh boulder or as good of a bouldering competition but then for for the guys the guys didn't have that great a week it was good to see nathaniel in the finals but like sean bailey got wrecked uh in yeah. qualifiers you didn't really see the other guys register at all um so it was kind of like a, a bit of both for for brooke it was an incredibly good weekend um and natalia as well obviously um but uh but yeah for the men it, it didn't seem as impressive sean in particular yeah yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have much to add. Those are great choices, Cody. I, I think, if anything, about the, the your Team Japan choice, um, I'll just say one of my winners that you know that I could have said instead of Yakob was Akio Noguchi. Um, I, I think it's just worth pointing out. Not maybe not necessarily a winner for for this this event solely because you know she didn't she didn't get any um, she, a gold medal or anything. She got let's see third place in lead. Um, and then I think she was fifth in the bouldering, but, uh, I mean, she's made it known that she's retiring after the Olympics and whatnot. So it, it's almost like you have to just point out, put her in the winner category for her career on the whole. I will save that for a later episode because I, I you know, I think, um, there's, she could still do great at the Olympics. And I think it's almost like there's, there's separate stuff to say about her career and stuff. But I will say to your point, Cody, it's interesting about team Japan I wonder if I, I wonder what will be lost um, on the team level, whether you want to say leadership level or whatever. If anything, I wonder what it will be like when Akio leaves, when Akio retires and she's no longer uh, captain, official or unofficial captain of that that J Japan team, whether that will impact their consistency and depth and all of that stuff, uh, I, you know. And I don't know, and I don't think anybody does know yet, but that'll just be something very, very interesting to track. Whether whether Akio's exit uh, has any impact on on Team Japan's consistency and depth and and high performance level. I would almost think that if the, if it was maybe uh, Team Slovenia and Yanya left, you'd see like a huge impact on how the team performs because you're like, oh, this is our this is our like leader she's she's able to like understand the events she clearly has this track record that is unmatched and but there's also not a huge pool of slovenian climbers who are competing at this level so i think her leaving could be like a massive impact on those other other folks whereas team japan uh, kind of the flip side of it they just have such a, a breadth of climbers in this pool that are so experienced and they're still getting this experience right like throughout this time 
and I, th I would imagine and I would hope that this would almost be like a non transition. Like you wouldn't even like you'd notice that she wasn't there and you'd be bummed that she wasn't competing and like traveling with you. But there's just like the other ninety Japanese competitors who are all like trying to make finals too and could have could have success at that because and they're just so the solid. Other, the other thing we'll mention is like who knows what her role will be in the future. Like I imagine she's got yeah. a life she wants to live, but she wouldn't be the first athlete that transitions to being a coach uh, and is at every single event still. So yeah, uh, but I, I agree. I, it'll be interesting to see what her role is and and if she if she did have a role greater than just being a climber in the ecosystem because like you have to imagine she's kind of a team mom just given her stature in that scene, how long she's been there, also being the oldest one in the delegation. Um, yeah, that's that's a really interesting angle to take, it's, and uh, it'll be it, curious. It, it'll be interesting because I think even if she ends up being a coach or some sort of role, that like it, it could have no impact. But like that is very different than having than, than like performing well every competition. I have obviously I'm as far from like the the elite competitor as possible. But the only thing like I can sort of relate it to is I just remember in high school when I ran track, we had this like, you know, our team was nothing, you know, spectacular on the state level, but we had this one runner who was, who was like, you know, elite for state and, and just kind of going into every meet, knowing that he was going to very likely perform well, right. It's, it's, it, there's like an intangible aspect there that's really hard to describe um, but it matters. It matters to a team just kind of knowing you have that stalwart who who even if everything goes wrong for the team, like that competitor still will probably do well. And I know that they kind of have Miho too. She's sort of in that role as well, but but it's really a Kyo, you know, and and so that I, I obviously to Cody's point, yeah, you hope that it will be a smooth transition and it won't make any difference. But the reality is it very it very well could. It'll be really interesting. Yeah. Let's uh, t talking about uh, losing athletes. Let's talk about biggest losers and uh, get to the toward the end of the show. Uh, Cody, you're going first. Oh man, so I I had a few a few options honestly, and I I kind of peeked at your notes, so I won't take I won't take yours uh your uh, thunder there, <laughs> but um, I kind of had one that and I don't like calling it loser at all. To just to be frank, so my my biggest loser is not a biggest loser. Um, it's a uh, it's kind of a biggest question mark, um, and I think I think it's Kyra, Kyra Condi. Um, that for me, I'm I'm a little I'm like worried for her almost. Uh, and again, unequivocally, Kyra, if you're listening, I love you. You're awesome. You are not a loser in any way, shape, or form. So I'm not saying that, but I'm like looking at her performance, and she'll be the first to tell you. I mean, hell, she she wrote about it on her on her Instagram, right? Like. Uh, right after right after the event don't have a ton to say about bouldering i'm still pretty bummed can't figure out what's been going on between these rounds right it's no secret she doesn't she's our olympian she's one of our two female olympians and she's really struggling and she doesn't she doesn't even know what the heck's going on like she's just missing like how many more 21st place finishes can this chick get right she's like so close on the cusp um and so i'm just like curious to see is is this going to be one of those situations where it stokes the fire right and she's like all right i've had it i'm gonna do something different and wild and i'm gonna like get over this speed bump and get ready for the olympics because that's basically all that's left between now and then or did this comp like really crush her and i don't know based on that post i'm like a little worried like she seems kind of like filled with question marks um, and so I truly hope she figures it out because one, she's a fantastic athlete. If you ever climbed with her, she is like bone crushingly strong, like her power, her like strength to weight ratio, her ability to like rock climb is, is pretty severe. I mean, I foreign, uh, we brought her and Nathaniel in for foreigning at the North American cup cause they didn't compete. They're on like super specific schedules and everything. So they, they didn't compete at the event. Um, Kyra did like some of the qualifier boulders, like in three tries for the men, like the men's qualities that meant like some of our like top athletes in the men's field weren't doing, or were taking like seven, eight, nine attempts, right? She has it. She has the ability. She knows what, uh, how to perform. And I don't know if it's like, if, if the question mark is, is like how to perform on this big stage is like, maybe that is that what it is? Because it's, it's clearly not like a physical aspect. It's, and it's not like a movement aspect. Uh, she's able to like yard on crimps and pull through and like do all these, like just traditional PCA 
style boulders just as well as uh she's doing like these like slingshot run and jump parkour triple paddle whatever and again doing them faster than guys in the men's field so like to me I, i'm sitting here too like what's going on like why what's the disconnect um so anyways yeah um hoping that that between now and uh in tokyo she'll like, kind of unlock whatever it is and then we're gonna see her you know really perform well and i i, I really have uh only the best uh best luck for her John, what do you think? Yeah, it's that's a it's a really interesting pick, Cody, because Tyler, I feel like we've maybe mentioned Kyra before um, on here on these debriefs this season. I, I my reaction has kind of I think I follow I've never met her, but I follow her on social media, and so and I think my own reaction to her performance has kind of mirrored her own reaction, right? Which it's almost like the first comp of the season. I don't remember her her exact placements and stuff, but it's like you you know. She she gets you know she's down there in the in the results and you're kind of like okay maybe it was just like a you know bad result or whatever and then like the next event it's kind of like she's she you know you kind of are like well it's two in a row what's going on and then like at this point she's like man I'm really bummed you know you read her post and it's kind of like yeah I'm, we're kind of re reacting the same way having that same response that it sounds like she is having to these performances um, I do think heading into the Olympics she. You know, she is consistently a great combined discipline competitor. She has won the combined discipline, the combined national championship, basically, in the U.S. Um, I, the combined invitational is what they call it. She's won that, and she's qualified for the Olympics in the combined discipline. So she's like, she's consistently good at the combined discipline. I think speed helps her a lot there. And I know her speed has, she's made big gains in her speed um, kind of in recent months, setting PRs and, and and whatnot. So so that's maybe um, sort of like a comfort in 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 all this. To, to if I'm a you know I am I'm a fan of Kyra and, and I know probably to her a, a comfort would be that her speed is improving and that's a that's one third of the the aspect of the combined discipline right. But in terms of bouldering, yeah, I you know just kind of I share the same exact reaction that she posted on her Instagram. Um, just I was bummed for. Her. I have yeah. to imagine that her response is is. Like, you're obviously trying to have the best season of your life, and she's watching these other athletes who she knows just ramp up these remarkable peaks in the performance. I'm sure she, I don't know if she's noticed like a, an increase in form in the people like Brooke or Natalia. Maybe, maybe they're just as strong as they were recently, but it's just that the results have now uh, really changed for those women. Um, but I have, like, I have to imagine, like, in my opinion, if when they qualified, Kyra was uh, more favorable to do well at the Olympics than Brooke based on the results that I would seen in the past. That is completely reversed uh, based on the form that we've seen, no doubt. And so I wouldn't be surprised if that kind of stuff is getting to her head of, wait, I've been training just as hard as these people and I'm not getting the returns when it comes to results that they are getting. And that has to be really mortifying when we're less than a month away from the show that you've been training now like two years for. That's got to be terrifying and disappointing. And like I, I can imagine it doesn't feel good. I think the part that I would say to try and reassure is guess what the field you're competing against at these world cups is not the field you're competing against uh when you get to the olympics right like cut out you know like four fifths of all these climbers they're all gonna be doing these different disciplines it's you know like don't don't let this stuff get to your head just stay on course i have to imagine that you know you're as strong as you ever were but i understand that this has to be like a mental strain feeling like she's not improving while these other people are, are improving so much, at least in terms of results. So yeah, that's a great pick actually. Um, yeah, it's uh, I, I, I definitely feel for her. Same thing kind of with Shauna um, where it's just like, you've been working at this and like Shauna and Kyra may have a kind of similarities where they've dealt with like physical uh, injuries and, and issues in their past. And that's something they've had to cope with. And, and Shauna kind of going through the same thing of like, man, I've been working on this. And now when I finally went to test it before the Olympics, I'm just not where I thought I was, man, it's gotta suck. Yeah. But it could, it could set her up for like this really cool dark horse story. Oh, right? totally. Like a, the story changes, the story like, changes instantly based on how she does. Like that's the, yeah. that's the messed up thing. So yeah, that's, that's an important it's point. It's, you know, it's the Olympics have not happened yet. And I, and I know that it's like, it sounds obvious, but like <laughs> as a competitor to get it into your head, like it, it's important to remember, right? Like these bad, bad results or results that you don't expect, or it's lower than you expect. 
that's not the Olympics, right? The, the like stay the course. Um, the 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 destination is still the same. It, you know, that's what that's what I would add to anything. Tyler, you said you know if she's listening, that's that's what I would add is that it's the story is still unwritten completely. So yeah, yeah. John, what about you for uh, for biggest loser? Yeah, you know, I probably would say Adam Andra for the for my for my choice for that and he, and for a couple reasons first of all most obviously in the lead round he had those he he slipped the first he slipped twice for people that might kind of not remember because it was a long time seems like a long time ago. he slipped twice he catches the first one remarkably it was like an incredible <laughs> I mean, incredible that he was able to hold on and stay composed it, it was fortunate that his left hand was on like the largest jug in that entire right. world cup so that was a good it was a good yeah. time to slip <laughs> of all yeah. times um and then he and then he slipped again later and, and fell off the wall and you you know you gotta think it's so unlikely it's so unlike him to slip at all you have to think that to do it twice on the same route especially knowing what we know about the conditions it had to be uh, based on weather or moisture on the holds or the just insane humidity or something like there had to be some X factor that was causing him to slip not once, but, but twice. Um, so, so it's kind of like, I, I would say he's in this category, the sort of the loser field for that reason, just because that was such an unfortunate uh, coupling of, of circumstances that ultimately, you know, put him really low in the, I don't remember what, what did he finished get? eighth? Uh, yeah, I got eighth. So so put him last in the finals field. But then the other thing that I I'm a little speaking of being worried, I don't know why he chose not to do the bouldering um, to compete in the in the bouldering stuff. People online were saying it's because his shoulder is still tweaked. People will remember he 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 kind of tweaked his shoulder in Salt Lake City um, and ended up uh, withdrawing from from that event. And then here he doesn't compete in the bouldering after the lead portion. And people were speculating that it was because his shoulder is still bad. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't, I didn't see him post anything about the reason he wasn't doing the bouldering is be, was because of his shoulder. If that is the case, if it was because his shoulder is still troubling him, uh, that's a, that's bad. Had, I mean, we're like, we just said with Kyrie, you're only, you know, who knows how many days out from the Olympics, not many. And to have a, a an injury be bad, bad enough that you're even if it's just cautionary that you're like that you're not doing a, a a discipline around that you thought you would i think i disagree just because like i he like he proactively took himself out of salt lake which was wise mm-hmm. and yes. then he comes to this event and still climbs in the lead finals like he's got there's there's four lead events before the olympics he doesn't have to climb in this one if he doesn't want to he can still go to Briançon, villar chamonix whatever he wants but he decided yeah. to do this one so to me that's a good signal for his shoulder health for the bouldering he's already competed in three events and he knows he's in excellent form so i i i don't take that as much of a caution i i think i take that as okay i've established that i've been good bouldering form i don't need to prove it why would i put myself through more trouble than i have to just focus on the lead so i can get those you know those those lead juices moving before uh, before the olympics so i don't read it that way in particular i agree that it was a brutal fall for him and the thing that just makes me laugh the most is that you've got this first event with this incredible new product from wata where they've got these covers for the bolt hangers so now adam andre is not going to get wrecked by stepping on a bolt like he was in the past and he still finds a way to like get absolutely wrecked and it's like it's so oh it's like you're, oh, it's not a technical thing. It's just you, you didn't climb very well. And it, that just made me laugh a lot. And of course, the framing of that climb where he gets out onto the mats and there is a close-up camera shot of his shoes while he's putting on his shoes. And it's just like a La Sportiva advertisement for the best climber in the world or his La Sportivas and trust them for like, you know, his biggest climbs of his life goes up and just a heel, like a heel cut is, is all that like takes him off. That is just like so, that's just... I don't know. That's uh, yeah. It's proof that there is a God. It was excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Did you have anything to add on that Cody or are you good? I mean, I don't, <laughs> I think it's just, a, uh, just like an unfortunate slip. I mean, these things happen and I think if anything, it's um, it just goes to show you how crazy the Olympics could be. I mean, we've been talking about it a lot. We talked uh, you know, a little bit about, you know, Kyra, for example, like she could have a great day. I mean, that's the thing is how how different are the Olympics 
than what we just saw versus sending your project outside. Sometimes you're feeling like in the best shape of your life. You're feeling great. Everything's clicking. And for whatever reason, you just like don't do well that day. Like something just happens and you don't do it. Mm -hmm. And then alternatively, we've probably all had that day where you're like X amount of days on, you're tired, you, you know, haven't eaten well, didn't sleep good. And then all of a sudden you send your hardest project to date because of whatever reason, you know, maybe like lack of attachment or who knows what. So it just goes to show you that you have like maybe arguably the strongest best lead climber in in the entire world and probably that we've seen in maybe ever um he can he can mess up too Mm -hmm. and he can mess up on the same world stage that anyone else can and i don't i i would say that it probably has so much less to do with adam and just more of this more of the fact the testament of like this is our sport this is what can happen i mean shit someone could could foot slip on the first move at, at the Olympics. You know what I mean? And that's it. That's, that's their Olympic career. It's over. Um, and I think if anything, that's, that's what kind of really sets the stage to show us like uh, anything, anything could happen. And it's really worth tuning in to, to see what it does. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, my, my biggest loser um, uh, is, uh laura regora and before we talk about this i just want to like couch it in as much protective bubble wrap so people like understand the scope i'm not going to talk about like every aspect of this issue i just want to talk about it narrowly and i actually wrote most of what i said ahead of time so i don't just like make it up on the spot um but basically i want to mention laura because i think the conversation around her weight is starting to like become a predominant discussion especially when you're talking about her specifically it's not so much about her climbing anymore Um, I think a climber's like physical form is a reasonable topic for audiences. I think we do it in, in all sports. We talk about the shape that they're in. Um, I think that's totally, uh, reasonable and common. Um, but I also agree it, it wouldn't make sense for like broadcasters to talk about it, especially in this particular framework. Um, John, you and I have talked about this issue a ton between the two of us, just, you know, um, just talking about the issue and how we feel about it and, and what we think the, the right course of action is for this entire topic in a competitive sport. Um, and we're very uncomfortable with like speculating on or shining a spotlight on the body and health of athletes, particularly young female athletes uh, feels especially sensitive. But anybody that's watching like this particular show an hour and 30 minutes in, I, I know that they are like comp diehards. They're probably very interested in the sport. They're probably very rational. So if you're watching right now, I'm trusting you to be somebody that is is pretty open to, to ideas and understand that nobody's coming from a malicious place talking about this. But anyway, I wanted to say that the discussion is out there. So apparently the topic came up in the YouTube chat, um, according to uh, Eddie Falk, who uh, we were speaking with as the comp was uh, moving on, he was watching the YouTube chat and he like kind of flagged to us, hey, this thing is happening. So that it was coming up in the YouTube chat, but the comments were being deleted by the moderator. Um, I don't know what the comments were. So I don't know if they were like repugnant, like trolly, awful comments, or if they were constructive and, and well-informed. Frankly, it was probably somewhere in the middle, knowing, uh, knowing the internet. Um, But on top of that, I've also now seen some evidence that at least one top tier athlete is having concerns about this issue as well. Um, So let me just kind of get my my thoughts out there. I think athletes should have complete autonomy over their bodies uh, and everybody is different. And I want to trust that the athlete and their coaches and their family and their federation have the athlete's best interest in mind. But in this field where each of those stakeholders that I just mentioned has a large financial interest in the athlete performing well. We're talking about an Olympian specifically and performing well, you know, on the biggest stage of the Olympics, it starts to mess with my faith that the climber's health is the priority. It just opens up the possibility that there are uh, other priorities. Um, the IFSC protocol is to test the BMI, the, is that body mass index? I actually can't remember what, yeah, body mass index of each qualified athlete before lead and boulder semifinals. And the consequences for athletes in the, like what they call the critical margin, so in a dangerously low uh, BMI, The consequences are that the medical commission of the IFSC sends a letter to the athletes federation in which they ask for an explanation regarding that athlete and the federation of that athlete will receive support from the IFSC medical commission uh, to deal with that situation if they if they deem that it needs uh, support or fixing or whatever you want to call it. Um, But to be clear, I can't find any evidence of a protocol that bars an athlete from competing based on their BMI. So because we don't 
like, I don't want to take an athlete's word ever on whether or not they're healthy. Like a, a big issue with this whole athlete weight eating disorder uh, context is that usually the person doesn't want to talk about it. Usually they're uncomfortable talking about it or they don't acknowledge it or they, you know, they, it's, that's one of the biggest issues about it is people not feeling comfortable talking about the problem that they're dealing with. So in this case, I don't want to take the athlete's word for it of whether or not they're healthy. And because in this case, the coach, family, and federation have this potential conflict of interest. And in this particular case, because we're all aware that the IFSC is based in Italy and is largely staffed by Italian personnel who are well-connected with the Italian federation, there's also that extra level of just like, you know, that kind of starts to worry you as well about possibly that conflict of interest seeping into maybe the IFSC uh, also. Um, I'm trying to figure out how I could feel reassured that those tests are being performed and they're being performed properly and that the IFSC protocol is being followed. Cause that's what I really want to know if they have a protocol. I really just want to know if they're following it. Right. Um, and I think what I'm hoping for is that other athletes, particularly those on the athletes commission are keeping an eye on these processes. Um, I don't want the athletes commission to have to come out and make public pronouncements about athletes health. Like that feels super weird to have like Shauna Coxie and Sean McCall, the presidents of the athletes commission have to like answer questions about like, is Laura Regora a healthy body weight or whatever. But I, I would love it if there was kind of a vote of, or a show of confidence from the athletes saying, Hey, there is a process. We respect it and we believe that it's working well, or maybe they don't even respect it. But just to say, like, there is a process, it's being followed. I am subject to it every time, blah, blah, blah. Like, just some reassurance that that process is happening. Um, and man, if if an athlete, you know, on the Athletes Commission or not, it doesn't really matter. If they were to actually show some kind of support, whether it's subtle or tacit, um, I think that would make it a lot easier for me to believe that the athlete was being treated fairly and properly and that the athletes community, you know, has faith in the process and that they believe that somebody like Laura is in the form to compete. And I bring all this up just because it is a topic of conversation amongst audiences. And the best way to deal with that is to say, hey, there is a process and we, the competitors, the people that directly compete against Lara and have the most interest in her being like disqualified or her not do like, you know, we want to beat her, right? Those are the people you want to have come out and say, no, we believe that she is in climbing form and, uh, and we trust this process. So I'm not asking you guys for comment on this. Um, I'm just going to say to anybody that's watching this, if you do comment in the chat, uh, please just remember that we're talking about somebody that is barely 20, if 20 at this point, like she is effectively a teenager. And uh, so please be extremely respectful in the fact that we're talking about an actual person, but I welcome your comments uh, in general about the process. Um, but yeah, so if, if you would like to comment, feel free. Otherwise, those are just kind of my thoughts. It's the fact that the audience is now talking about it and the IFSC, at least the moderator in particular, felt that it wasn't a topic that was appropriate to talk about, which I disagree with. Um, I think it's at the point where people do start to have to at least be honest about what is the process? How does this work? Let's not keep it in the dark at the very least. But yeah, so those are my opinions. Um, do either of you guys want to mention anything? You don't have to. Otherwise, we'll just move on. I, I, that's that's all that's very well said i mean obviously there's a lot to unpack there um but i would just it, what you said about transparency and information i mean that's really what it comes down to in, in terms of what we want as we observe this and to to underscore what you said yeah this is something that it's just stating a fact that people were chatting about this and are chatting about this and um so yeah 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 i i don't have a I'm not educated enough on these topics and I'm not also, uh, you know, I'm a bigger white, white guy, white male who doesn't have never had issues, uh, you know, with, you know, this type of thing before. So I can't really speak much or at all to it. Um, I will say though, that I think regardless of where you fall on it is that ultimately we just hope that the athletes are being, being safe. They're taking, being taken care of. And also know that it's a really, it can be a really tricky conversation and it's a really delicate conversation. Um, especially considering our sport. And I mean, I guess the one part I could, you know, you could discuss just like kind of from 5,000 miles away is that, um, and this is maybe, maybe it's from 5,000 miles, maybe it's up close strength to weight ratio is like, it's no secret that this is like a huge part of our sport. And it's, it's a tricky balance because especially at this high level, 
people's bodies are entirely different. What What is healthy and normal for one may not be healthy and normal for another. Um, so whatever, you know, whatever lands, I just hope that the powers that be and who, you know, kind of create and enforce these, uh, these procedures are doing it from the most well-informed uh, stance that they can, that they can have and not doing it from any other place. Like this has to be specifically about climbing um, and thinking about our athletes and their health and their performance. Um, because it is a very, it is a very thin line for a lot of folks. Um, and especially when you said BMI, I mean, that's a whole other thing that like, unless they're doing like really rigorous and strict testing, BMI is a crock of shit. And I can speak to that um, directly. And I will throw myself in the fire here because anyone who's still <laughs> listening um, who knows me, I'm by far and away like the heaviest root setter that, uh, that is, I guess, consistently root setting on any sort of circuit. Uh, I weigh 230 pounds, right? My BMI is off the chart. Like my doctor was like, yo, dude, you are obese, right? Like he said that. <laughs> he, he didn't say, yo, dude, but he was like, but right? But, so my BMI is so skewed that my mom was like, you better get that figured out because your insurance might change now and i'm like hmm. there's no way they actually think like i'm obese right but the thing is is they use like this really bullshit way of calculating these percentages and so i'm only saying all this to make sure that whoever is doing this do it right and don't screw it up because there's people's health on the line and then secondary to that there's people's uh performance and their their livelihood uh, and their sport on the line. So as long as those things are taken into consideration and they're doing it in the best way, that's that's my only hope for for everyone involved in um, yeah moving forward. For anyone interested in in the details that I was referring to about how the medical commission deals with this issue, um, on the IFSE website, ifse-climbing.org, scroll to the bottom of the page. There's a bunch of links. You want to click the one for the medical and anti-doping commission. And that shows you a bunch of the different initiatives that the Medical Commission deals with. In particular, you want to click on the heading called Addressing Actual Issues in Consideration of Health. That's the one you want to click to learn more about this stuff if you want to check out the at least the published procedure. Maybe there are other things that are unpublished, but that's what's on the website. Uh, so yeah. Well, in that case, uh, I just wanted to tie up any loose ends. The one thing I just wanted to mention was how big this event was. John touched on, uh, on it on the top. You had a, a huge World Cup. The fact that both men's and women's bouldering qualifiers were both split into two heats. They were running two full length boulder walls. It's incredible. Like when I saw the boulder wall for the comp, I was like, that's not the that's not the Kletterzentrum wall. That's a different one. And I realized that they so they have a huge outdoor wall that they were running for qualifiers, and then they built a second one on the other side of the venue so that they could have all this going on that on top of the european uh, speed cup and on top of that the para climbing world cup the amount of athletes that the clutter centrum in innsbruck and uh, uh the austrian federation were dealing with was unreal we obviously weren't on the ground i don't know how well it went but i just want to give a shout out to everybody involved in that for pulling off such a huge show at least from our end aside from those broadcasting issues and the weather um it was really incredible so just you know you know, thank a thank a root setter, thank a, a, a front desk person, thank thank the admin, thank the judges. Like just our, uh, they took on a huge job and they did a good job. So yeah. Um, any yeah. any uh, like closing thoughts or things we didn't cover before we uh, call it? Uh, I'll just, I just want to give an honorable mention. This I'll make it quick. We didn't. I don't think we mentioned uh, Stasha Gejo there for the winners, but um, she deserves a nod because I feel like I feel like Tyler. Every time we talk about an event, we keep. We keep like upping the ante with Sasha, that to, which just speaks to her great performance. Like at first, it was just like, oh, it's great that she's back, right? Mm -hmm. Like at all from that big injury. And then it was like, oh, well, it's great that she's making finals. And and now it's like, oh, it's it's even greater that she's meddling. Um, so just props to her. Um, she just she just keeps keeps improving, improving to the point where now I think she's in top form back from that injury, if not better than she's ever been. You know, she gets a, a well deserved medal. It's great to watch her climb and really happy for her. Yeah. And uh, the, other, the other thing real quick is I flashed this image as as uh, Cody was talking about, I think, uh, Kyra. So I probably screwed everybody up. But anyway, just uh, Miho Nanaka. It looked dramatic. She got wheeled out to uh, to the hospital after a knee injury in um, the uh, the final problem of semifinals. Uh, but we we found out later on that uh, that she was back at the venue. We saw her on camera and we were actually talking with a photographer, uh, Sitzfen Sluten. I probably 
demolished his name. So I'm very sorry, Sitz. Uh, but he was in the Plastic Weekly Discord. We gave him a call and he kind of gave us like a a, um, a sideline interview from the venue for a couple minutes and and managed to tell us that, uh, that yeah, Miho was limping a little bit. Uh, so while she was back at the venue, it looked like there was vis- uh, visible evidence that she was still coping with the pain at the very least. So uh, we wish her the best uh, and hopefully they can manage that before uh, before the Olympics. And on the Akio thing, we'll talk about that later. There is much to be written, um, but also much to be researched before we start talking about it because it's, you know, a very long uh, history of her comp. So we'll, we'll get to that later. But uh, it was, uh, yeah, last one for her. Peace, Akio. We'll see you at the Olympics. That's pretty much it. But yeah, otherwise, I think we're good. So I want to thank both of you. John, you're muted. It looks like you're talking, but you're totally muted, bro. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that. I'm, I'm new to this. Uh, so, Cody, did you have anything you wanted to say in closing? Uh, no, I mean, you brought up Miho. I actually called an audible on that one, so that was my fault on yeah, for that image there. <laughs> I uh, thought you were winding yeah, up to yeah. it, but it's all good. Yeah, you were like doing it. And I, was, so I, read, I was reading yours, and I saw Miho, and I was like, oh, right. he's going to say Miho, so I'll pick something else. Gotcha. But, uh, okay, cool. Um, but in any case, no, I just – yeah, I'm wishing her the best. Um, I actually have come off in the past year from a, a pretty serious knee injury as well. And uh, on a pretty similar move, uh, left heel hook and just pulling really, really hard. And um, hopefully, you know, for her, this is just like a strain and she's just being cautious. Like she was limping off, but like hopefully she was like, OK, I pulled it. That's it. I'm going to be done with it. And, uh, you know, everything will be fine in the next, you know, four to six weeks and she'll be good. Um, hopefully it's nothing more than that. So uh, best of luck to you, Miho. Yeah. All right. Well, I want to thank you both, uh, John, as always. Thanks very much for uh, for the call. Cody, thank you for joining. And I, I mean, we actually reached out to you really late. So the fact that this worked out has been <laughs> yeah. awesome. Uh, I really appreciate you joining us for the show. Uh, and of course, to you for watching. Thanks for joining us for another very long episode of The Debrief. Uh, if you want to support this, you can always uh, support on Patreon. The link in the description. Give the video a like and comment about whatever you want. I won't read it as always, but John will. Uh, and you can subscribe. And then lastly, if you're watching this far, you need to join the plastic weekly discord it's still a small group but we have some really incredible industry people hanging out in that discord we watch the competitions together in there and like i just mentioned earlier we managed to get a sideline interview with somebody from the venue during the rain break uh, so if you want a, a better experience than watching the youtube chat come hang out with us it's a it's a pretty good time but with that we'll close it we're going to see you guys next week for brian son do i have that right is it brian son or villars I think Villars. Villars. Lead and speed in Villars. Yeah, we'll call it Villars. If not, whatever. It's all good. Uh, So we'll see you next week for that. Otherwise, uh, yeah, have have a good week. Stay safe, and we'll see you in the next one.